Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm once again taking you beyond the board, this time with special guest Matthew Kirschenbaum, who is coming on today to talk to me about Kriegspiel, the OG war game. How are you doing today, Matthew? I'm good, thanks, Liz. Do you want to give us a short bio of who you are and what you do? Uh, sure. So I, I, I teach. I'm a professor at the University of Maryland in College Park, right outside of D.C. I teach in the English department there. Um, a lot of my teaching involves contemporary literature, but also computers, different forms of media, the impact of all that stuff on literary production. Somewhere along the way, I also developed an interest in rare books, old books, and also war games. So out of curiosity, before we dig into Kriegspiel, what is the connection between all of your literary work and war games? Is it a separate interest or do you see them as intertwined in some way? Well, um, a little bit of both. War games have really been a kind of a hobby for me for a long time since I was a kid, uh, an adolescent growing up and you know, I think my origin story is pretty similar to other people's from my my demographic. I I saw you know the the big orange Panzer Blitz box on the shelf next to the Dungeons and Dragons, and I ended up taking both home and I played both and got into both RPGs and war games as a kid. And then I you know I put that stuff aside for a while as I um, as I got older. But then. Um, Maybe, gosh, um, close to 20 years ago now, um, I went back. I never really went back to role-playing, but I did go back to war games. Um, that's just where the, the pull, the allure was. And since then, in terms of my academic work, my professional work, I do occasionally write, publish on topics in games and game history. And with, um, with Pat Harrigan, I co-edited a um, a pretty hefty volume from MIT Press called Zones of Control, which is an 800-page compendium of articles and essays from uh, war game designers, from uh, historians, from theorists, all sorts of different folks, defense industry people. That's just a kind of um, yeah, it's a kind of enormous primer, if you will, for um, for both professional and recreational war gaming. So. You know, that's something that goes on my academic vita. And um, yeah, so there is a little bit of a, there's some crossover there. That sounds like a really interesting read. And I mean, really, it doesn't sound any longer than, oh, <laughs> the rule book to a GMT game these that's days, right? right? That's right. Um, <laughs> just uh, only a little bit, only slightly longer. Right. It, it'll be a breeze. Yeah. No, I actually do want to read that book. That yeah. sounds really good. Yeah. And you know, it's the, you, you don't, n nobody reads it cover to cover. In other words, the beauty of it is you can dip in and out and you can, you, you know, you can digest it in bite sized chunks, whatever pieces of it interest you. So is it your interest in history and in old things that led you all the way back to Kriegspiel? I think so. Um, you know, when I get interested in something, my my instinct, and this is, I guess, another place where my, you know, my my gaming and my academic um, instincts coincide. Um, I just I want to know the whole story. I, you know, I again, I grew up playing hex encounter war games, but I wanted to sort of know where they came from, and it wasn't enough for me to learn about Charles Roberts and Avalon Hill and the original tactics in Gettysburg back in the 1950s. I, I wanted to know more. And so I, I kept reading and learning and, you know, lots of other people have been over this ground before me. And so that led me back to you know, certainly H.G. Wells, who, you know, again, turns out to be somebody who's both a literary figure, but as you know, he also uh, published a a slim volume entitled Little Wars, which he published in, I'm just double checking my copy. Um, when did this come out? This would have been, uh, you know, late 19th century, I believe. Anyway, so I found things like Little Wars from H.G. Wells, which also famously bears the obnoxious title a game for subtitle a game for boys from 12 years of age to 150 and for that more intelligent sort of girl who likes boys games and books wow <laughs> so thank you mr hg wells for that 
Um, Robert Louis Stevenson um, also um, was a, in between writing novels like Treasure Island and Kidnapped, he, um, he, he played war games. Um, and then eventually that took me back to the early 19th century, to Prussia, and to the, the game that we call Kriegspiel. So a lot of people listening will maybe not have a full understanding of what exactly Kriegspiel is. So can you give us the layperson's introduction? What is Kriegspiel? Sure. So, so Kriegspiel, of course, is a German word that translates literally as war game, Kriegspiel war game. And that causes some confusion because there are lots of games out there that are referred to as Kriegspiels or Kriegspiel, which are not the actual rule set that we're going to be talking about on this program, which originated in 19th century Prussia. So, for example, Avalon Hill, who we mentioned a moment ago, um, they, they, they have a game in their catalog called Kriegspiel that they published in the, the 1970s. But it has nothing to do with the Kriegspiel that we're going to be talking about, other than the fact that it, too, is a war game. And so there's always a little bit of sort of terminological confusion that goes along with the word that I like to kind of um, clarify. Just as one other example, there's a a chess variant called Kriegspiel um, that was famously played by John von Neumann, who was a kind of foundational figure in computer science. And sometimes people come across that tidbit and they'll say, oh, look, von Neumann was a war gamer. He played Kriegspiel. Well, no, he, he played chess. He was a chess aficionado, and he liked a chess variant called Kriegspiel. But again, that's not the Prussian Kriegspiel. And so the Prussian Kriegspiel that we're going to be talking about is the product of a father and son duo, the von Reichwitzes. And the elder von Reichwitz first introduced the game and its rules around about 1812. And then his son, George, produced a um, refinement of them, a kind of second edition, if you will, about a decade later in 1824. And those two rule sets um, became what we um, are going to talk about today as as Kriegspiel. The 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 longer the the full name of the the game is the um it comes with the so I, I won't even attempt the German pronunciation, but it comes with the English title of um let's see instructions for a mechanical device that represents military maneuvers to the senses. A mechanical device? Yes, which, I mean, the, the, t- the subtitle is actually fascinating for just that reason. A mechanic instructions for a mechanical device or apparatus that represents military maneuvers to the senses. And yeah, I mean, that just rolls off the tongue, right? Absolutely. Also, <laughs> I... I'm very curious about how war games can appeal to all of my senses because I haven't right. seen that yet. Yeah, well, I mean, we, you know, we do know. I mean, one thing people always talk about is sort of the reason they, you know, a lot of people say they like war games is because they're 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 not on the screen. It's tabletop. They're tactile. They're, you know, they're sort of they they kind of engage your senses, your body, in sort of ways that sitting and staring at a screen don't. So there's there's that dimension. But what what I think that long German subtitle was getting at, so the 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 first um iteration of Kriegspiel, um, and again this was the work of von Reichwitz the the Elder, initially it was a set of rules that he devised for what's called a sand table, which um you know, we we still see sand tables in use today. It's basically it's essentially a sand box that's at tabletop height that's filled with sand that can be sculpted in a way to sort of mimic realistic terrain features. But that wasn't um, very sort of practical or portable. So what von Reichwitz the Elder did was he actually built a and you can find pictures of this online. It's it's 
it survives um, in a museum in, in Berlin, and it's quite beautiful. Um, it's, it's a piece of furniture, essentially. It's a cabinet, a storage cabinet that he custom built to house all of the pieces of his game. And those pieces consisted of plaster, three-dimensional plaster tiles to represent terrain. So a great analogy would actually be the, um, the hexagons in Settlers of Catan. Um, where you kind of place the hexagons to, to build the island as you play the game. The original Kriegspiel worked in much the same way. You would have these plaster tiles that you could lay out in different sort of reconfigurable ways. And then you would have um, little wood or lead markers, tokens, to represent troop formations um, that you would place on your terrain. And then you had a rule set for maneuvering and fighting those troop formations. And it's worth also just um, pausing for a moment to emphasize that, you know, we often like to tell stories of invention that are what I think of as sort of the great man story, the you know, proverbial light bulb goes off and someone has a flash of genius and inspiration and everything follows from that. That you know, as is so often the case, that's not the real story here either. Von Reichwitz was building on a tradition of um, ever more elaborate chess variants that were popular throughout the 18th century and which had begun to introduce game elements like terrain depiction. So yeah, chess, you have black and white squares and that's it. But you started to see chess variants in the 18th century where squares could be forests or rivers or hills. And then also you started to see again in these early chess variants, you started to see um, asymmetrical forces. Not Both sides did not have the exact same lineup. And so von Reichwitz had all of those ideas to draw on, but one of the key things that he did was he kind of jettisoned the um, the chess grid entirely and replaced it with these um, you know these these really again quite amazing looking plaster tiles to actually you know build a kind of landscape for the game to unfold upon and troops could be positioned um, you know troops weren't confined to any kind of grid they could just be maneuvered naturally. So I was actually going to ask, you know, Kriegspiel did not necessarily have its roots as a military training exercise. It was something that had its roots and ancestry among hobbyist gamers who were looking to have fun. Is that accurate? I mean, how did it get into the military? Yeah, so I, that, that, that's sort of accurate. You know, again, there there was certainly what we would, you know, nowadays call a hobbyist, and they would certainly have had their their Facebook groups and whatnot back in the day, if those had existed. There were certainly hobbyists who tinkered with chess and other board games to produce sort of you know, military-inflected variants. But the von Reichwitzes, both the father and the son, I think very much um, had a, uh, a military audience in mind for what they were doing. And the story that's famously told is that the... Um, the, the, the younger son. So von Reichwitz, the elder, um, eventually gets an audience with the, the king of Prussia, um, Wilhelm III. He demonstrates the game for Wilhelm, who was very smitten with it and becomes a kind of favorite pastime of the royal household. But then the son, um, who introduces some key further refinements to Kriegspiel that we should talk about, but the son famously, about a decade later in 1824, I believe, does a demonstration for the Prussian officer corps. And the story that's repeated in every account of Kriegspiel is that initially the professional officers are very skeptical. Why are we wasting our time with this game and so forth? And then after they watch it, unfold for a little while, one of them exclaims, this is not a game at all, this is training for war. Whereupon the order is passed down, 
every every unit, every battalion in the Prussian military is to be furnished with a Kriegspiel set that they are to learn and continually drill and practice with. And from there, it, it, it does enter into the Prussian military. So this is a good moment to talk about furnishing everybody with a set and some of the yeah. changes that are made to Kriegsfield, because there's no way that you're going to have a fancy piece of furniture no. for everyone in the military to play Kriegsfield. So how do we make it work for a larger audience and spread it widely? Mm-hmm. So at this point, it does become, and again, keep in mind, you know, we're still talking about the early 19th century here, but it, you know, it becomes something essentially like a, a boxed set in the way that like, say, a GMT game is today. So um, the beautiful, amazing plaster terrain tiles were replaced with, with maps, with military topographic maps. And so those, of course, were easy to, to reproduce. The, the playing pieces were made out of ordinary lead, and everything was scaled in such a way so that um, when you laid one of the playing pieces on top of the topographical map, the piece occupied the same area, the same frontage as an actual troop formation, cavalry, infantry, and artillery battery, whatever it was, it occupied the actual space on the map that um, troops would occupy in in real life. And so um, another kind of key, absolutely sort of essential refinement that um, the younger von Reischwitz made to the game was he turned it into essentially a a team game or a collaborative game, um, or not collaborative. You see, you, you had your two sides. You had red and blue, but each side would typically be composed of multiple players. And then you would have a third team, the the referees or the umpire team. These were inevitably the senior officers to whom the the younger officers and the cadets were already. You know, they already had the fear of God in them. And then the, so the elder officers would serve as the umpires and each side, red and blue, would be placed in a, in a separate room. Each would have its own map of the terrain and the umpires would go from room to room adjudicating who could see what on their maps. So it was a way of creating the proverbial fog of war. It was a way of duplicating hidden maneuvers and feints because the umpire would have the complete picture. But again, unless, for example, your force had, say, I don't know, a a cavalry screen out in front of it, you wouldn't be able to see what was lurking over the next hill. So that was one of the key ways that the game taught fundamental tactics to um, to the the trainees and it's it's that's that's very different of course from what we think of nowadays when we think of a typical war game where you know you've got a map on a table and two players sitting side by side and you know this really was a kind of a, a group effort that you needed to kind of think carefully about how it was all going to operate, where the different rooms would be, and so forth. One thing that's interesting that you mentioned is, you know, red versus blue, that Mm. is a distinction that has continued into professional war games in the United States today. Did it start with Kriegspiel? I believe it did. Um, I I don't know the, the origins or the explanation for exactly why red and blue, I, I, but I believe it did originate with Kriegspiel, yes. So typically, red is is usually the enemy, right, for the from the perspective of the country that's running the sim, and then blue is your guys. Is that correct? Yeah, and that's where. So the you know this is also a gaming term. The idea of red teaming, where you sort of have a kind of you know a group of sort of devil's advocate people who are there to poke holes in your your perfect solution, but. Um, yeah, obviously, red versus blue, those are those are still colors that have a lot of currency with us nowadays, don't they? It is true. So have you ever gotten to play Kriegspiel yourself? Um, that's a great question. And the answer is a little bit. I've, I've played some um, at, I've played 
you know, in short sessions at a couple of different conventions where I've gotten uh, just a little bit of the flavor for the game. I have a small Kriegspiel set myself, and if you like, we can sort of talk more about how to kind of source the game now and put a set together for yourself. But um, I am, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm certainly not a, a, an, a, an umpire. I'm not, um, I think, um, at least not without some reading and studying up, I'm not prepared to actually run a creep scale game myself that's fair i actually would be interested in knowing how to source but but before we get there the rules that you have now from what i understand creep also had several different rules releases over the course of the years when it was in active use as a military exercise it did um and that's a really kind of fascinating aspect of the history too It, it goes to the question of the game's influence so the the younger um, von Reichwitz George came to a a, a really tragic end. Um, I think in part because of the success of the game, he he was unpopular with fellow officers. He he was he had political enemies, and eventually he was kind of um, exiled to a kind of backwater posting, and um, eventually he he committed suicide. But um, what that meant was that the game had lost its steward. And so, as is the way of such things, gamers being gamers, you you saw a couple of different things happen. Um, some players of Kriegspiel, and you know, now we're talking for the sort of full span of the 19th century as the game continued to get played in Prussia, but other countries as well as its influence spread, some players decided that what they needed to do was to make the rules increasingly elaborate. Um, warfare was also changing. Von Reichwitzes had introduced their Kriegspiel in the Napoleonic era, but um, as we know, throughout the 19th century, warfare itself was changing in fundamental ways. And so you started to see ever more elaborate rules layered on top of the original Kriegspiel. Um, this became known as rigid Kriegspiel. And, you know, it's, it, it, it was essentially the advanced squad leader of its day. The contrast to that is what became known as free Kriegspiel. And that was basically a style of play in which rules were really um, minimized and all of the sort of essential game decisions were rendered by the umpire. Um, So, you know, combat. Again, in the original Kriegspiel, and this is noteworthy too, Kriegspiel came with a set of specialized dice, D6s, but not your ordinary D6s. Um, They were dice. Different dice would be rolled in different situations, and the different dies had um, columns of numbers on their faces representing different combat results. Anyway, that's how combat would be adjudicated, much like we see in many war games now. But by later in the 19th century, people started to say, well, just let the empire decide. You know, you've got a bunch of guys going up a hill attacking someone else, and one side has artillery support and one side doesn't. You know, don't, don't, don't look up rules and roll dice. Just let the empire figure it out. That became known as free Kriegspiel. And there was an American variant of free Kriegspiel called Strategos. Uh, nothing to do with... Yeah, nothing to do with the nothing to do with Stratego, the board game we all played growing up. <laughs> but um, Strategos, which were sort of Americanized free Kriegspiel rules by a guy named Totten, um, those that rule set found its way into the hands of somebody named Dave Arneson, who of course is one of the co-creators of Dungeons and Dragons. And so there's a sense in which the free Kriegspiel tradition gave us a kind of model for the game master or dungeon master, a kind of all-powerful figure who is the lord of that universe adjudicating what happens in the game. And, you know, I think in the distinction between free and rigid Kriegspiel, you sort of have the two sort of poles of the hobby in 
something like a GAN advanced squad leader on the one hand versus um, you know, various role playing um, styles on the other hand. It is amazing to think about those games that we have today as basically descendants of Kriegspiel, especially because of how different they seem and how different their audiences are. That's amazing. So if you were going to reconstruct original Kriegspiel for yourself, how would you go about doing that? What would it look like and whose rules would it have? Yeah, so the, the good news is you, you don't have to sort of um, break into that museum in Berlin to, to, to make off with the original um, cabinet and set. You can source the rules. There is a British company, Two Fat Lardies, two spelled <laughs> T-O-O, Two Fat Lardies. You can find them online, but they will sell you a very um, attractively full produced, full color, perfect bound copy of the um, of the original 1824 von Reich von Reichwitz Kriegspiel, and um, you can buy that booklet and um, you know read it as you would any other rule set for any other game and use it to um, to run Kriegspiel with. In terms of the the playing pieces, I think one of the attractions of Kriegspiel is it has a little bit of a kind of DIY element to it. You can um, you know, you can source the maps from wherever you choose. Uh, again, Two Fat Lardies also has some map sets they will happily sell you, but other uh, Kriegspiel players will use historical maps that they've scanned and you know, colorized a bit. And um, you know, I think one of the real attractions of Kriegspiel, which we've touched on, is that an attractively produced Kriegspiel set looks absolutely splendid on the tabletop. You have a large, gorgeous map that's, you know, again, not sort of gunked up with squares and hexagons. It looks very natural. You have three-dimensional pieces on top of it in different colors. Um, you can really sort of like trick your set out. There's a company, um, which I can send you the link for, and you can include it on the, um, the podcast page. Uh, but there's a, a company that uses um, 3D printing. And of course, with, you know, with 3D printing and laser cutting and all of that now, this has become very achievable for many people. Um, but there's a company that will sell you um, sort of prefabbed Kriegspiel pieces, including the special dice that I mentioned a few moments ago. So, you know, for, for really not much more than you would spend on, you know, the latest GMT game, uh, you can put together a, a pretty sort of um, nice set for yourself just from going to a couple of different online vendors to source different pieces of it. That is really cool. This might be like a project, especially if we're still stuck at home for a while. So actually, I want to I want to circle back to one more thing before I ask you a couple of modern day questions. And that is, so you mentioned dice for Kriegspiel. Uh, I'm not an expert on this era or on gaming in this era, but from what I understand, people had mixed feelings about using dice and randomization to determine the outcome of combat, especially in a society that had valued chess so much. So how does that, is Kriegspiel an early game where probability is used to determine that? Or, you know, how, where does it fit into that ecosystem? Yeah, no, very much so. And that's, um, you know, that's really, I think, something to emphasize that, um, you know, I think what von Reichwitz would say is that this is not chance, this is not randomness, this is a, a, a this is probability, this is a spectrum of outcomes. You know, von Reichwitz himself, both father and son, were heirs to enlightenment rationalism, um, a worldview in which you know the 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 world was a kind of uh, complete interlocking system that was knowable and understandable. Uh, there was a great vogue at the time for military mathematics for you know modeling the impact of firepower on troop formations and so forth. And so all of that was kind of in their background. And the dice were there because there there is no certainty in, in warfare. Um, there are probabilities, but there are no certainties. And in much the same way that a combat results table in a, you know, the war games we play today gives you a spectrum of reasonable outcomes, um, that's precisely what the Kriegspiel dice were doing. And um, that, you know, that, 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 that was one of the key 
sort of innovations of, of the game that is still with us today. Fascinating. So you are also a hobbyist gamer in your regular life today. Do you think that we are playing any games now that are going to be as historically significant mm. as Kriegspiel is? That's a great question. Historically significant, um, it's, it's hard to say. I, you know, I, I, you know, especially nowadays, it's hard to know where we're going to be in a month from now, let alone, <laughs> let alone 50 years down the road. You know, I, I do think that gaming is very much a, a kind of a, a living tradition that it's responsive to things happening in its own moment. So on the one hand, you know, I think it's really important to talk about historical lineage and influences and the significance of something like Kriegspiel. But, you know, I think one of the most interesting things that's happening in wargaming right now, we were talking a little bit about this before we got started, is the way in which wargames have sort of gotten away a little bit from uh, what we might think of as the kind of force-on-force -force dynamic that Kriegspiel is modeling one group of guys with rifles or sharp sticks on one side of the hill, another group of guys with rifles or sharp sticks on the other side of the hill, and they go at it. Um, that's not all that wargaming is nowadays. There's a lot more interest in the hobby now in uh, political military gaming and uh, the, the coin series, which I know you've talked about on the podcast, and essentially using game mechanics to model a wide range of historical situations. And I see that as, you know, we were talking a little bit about some of Tom Russell's games before we got started, like This Guilty Land. And so I think the idea that gaming is a way of sort of encountering the world around us and all of its complexities, that's something I, you know, I do hope is still with us, you know, a couple of hundred years down the road. So one more question, a pure hobbyist question. Uh, what games are you personally enjoying right now? So right now at this instant in time, what I have set up on my table is a Napoleonics game. It's the uh, Last Eagle system from a company called Hexasim. Um, and it's the, the Battle of Quatre Bras, which is um, one of my favorite Napoleonic engagements to game. One thing I like doing um, when I when I get interested in a topic or a battle is I'll often play several different games on it and using different systems one after another. So um, I'm thinking of um, getting out the, the Labatai treatment of it next and giving that a crack. That sounds absolutely fantastic, <laughs> actually. All right. So I've taken up enough of your time today, although I actually think we could probably podcast again in the future. I'm findable anywhere on the internet as Beyond Solitaire. But Matthew, where can we find you? Yeah. So, um, well, you can usually find me at the, the University of Maryland. And um, were the campus um, under normal operations, I would probably be on the third floor of Taws Hall, where I, um, I have a space called Book Lab, where I do letterpress printing. Um, so that's, um, that's, that's another one. So uh, it seems I often, lead is always in my life, whether we're talking about miniature figures or whether we're talking about um, movable type. But I am based at the University of Maryland. I'm easy to find on the internet. And I'm also, um, I think one of the best ways to track me down is on Twitter, where I am at M. Kirschenbaum. And so that's, that's where I am. Matthew, thank you so, so much for coming on and enlightening us about Kriegspiel. Uh, everyone who is listening, please feel free to reach out to either of us with questions. Thanks for being here and happy gaming. Oh, thanks, Liz, so much. This was a lot of fun to do.